So, welcome Bhagwan. Thank you for um, having this talk with us. I like to put these things on video just so that we can sort of share our experience. We just finished a uh, weekend seminar. We sat for five hours on both Saturday and Sunday and uh, with, with the meditation. And the interesting thing that came up for me is last night um, we went to a kirtan concert, something we don't normally do in the middle of the seminar. And so it gave me a very different sense about what we were involved in because at the concert, you know, people were very ecstatic and the musician, you know, was just creating this, uh, this sensation. People were all in, uh, in their feelings. Uh, and it was raising feelings, and everyone's out there, you know, with their hands opened, you know, trying to receive like, you know, like antennas, trying to get a little bit of spirit. Uh, so, and so it raised this question because it's, normally I'd go to a concert like that, and I said, well, this is great fun. But I also uh, felt that there was a, a huge limitation there. And, you know, and maybe you can just sort of comment on, on what is happening in a Kirtan concert versus what we're trying to do. Yeah. Uh, what's happening in the Kirtan is uh, singing, devotion, devotional singing, and uh, everyone's enjoying it. Mm -hmm. It's like an enjoyment or entertainment. And just because uh, it's a religious subject or religious song doesn't mean it's not entertainment. So it's entertainment and it's at the mental level. Mm -hmm. So you have three planes of activity. One is the physical, where you could do yoga, exercise and da daily activities. Mm -hmm. Then there's the mental, which is intellectual activity or devotional activity like this kirtan. And so that's physical and mental. What we are practicing is to get beyond physical and mental. So, so stop right there, because you're saying that the, the kirtan is mental. Yeah. Which goes against how most people think of something Yeah, like it's it. mental in the sense that the mind is involved. You're singing, there are words, there's movement. There's body and mind involved. Mm -hmm. That's why it's mental. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are doing, the pra what, what I like to call our practice, not meditation, I like to know, I've changed the terminology. Mm -hmm. I prefer to call it practice of silence. Mm -hmm. But as your mm -hmm. question was earlier, there's so many types of meditation. Most of them are mental. Mm -hmm. And what we are practicing is the practice of silence. That's the only state that's not mental. So silence, when we say silence, that's more than just cessation of speaking. Quite right. Not making sounds. Yeah. So what does that mean, silence? Yeah, silence is not just uh, the ordinary meaning of silence is absence of speech or sound or noise. Mm -hmm. But our understanding of silence or what we are seeking in silence is the quietening of mind, distancing of thoughts, feelings, perceptions, sensations getting distant from these, letting these go. And when you do this, the mind becomes quiet, you become clear. And when there's no thought at all, then you're in a state of silence. Mm -hmm. So uh, feelings, sensations, thoughts, is all in the category of mind. Mental, yeah. Mental, Mental. or mind, yeah. Or mind. Yeah. So uh, in order to uh, approach what uh, we're calling the, st the practice of silence. Yeah. Um, it, it requires sort of disengaging um, from uh, even our, our sensation of ourself. Quite right. Of our, and so uh, in one arena, we're trying to you know, raise uh, the feeling body you know, to an ecstatic state. And in this other approach, we're trying to sort of drain it free. <laughs> Yeah, get, get free of it, yeah. <laughs> get free of it. Yeah, because the, <clears throat> the emotion is also an entanglement. Mm -hmm. That just as your thoughts entangle you, emotions also entangle you, however religious they might be. Mm -hmm. They're still entanglement. So there's this, I, I, and I have to admit, I was very entangled 
and enjoyed it immensely. But the it's same enjoying. Yeah, it's so enjoyable. It was enjoyable. <laughs> so, so is a rock concert so enjoyable. So is a rock concert. <laughs> yeah, a rock concert also has a certain energy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, let's talk about then um, if you know, the, the goal of the practice is to detangle from, from the mental. Uh, and the mental uh, includes our entire sense of, of me. It's my whole story, what I'm trying to, to do in a day, you know, all of my, my agenda, my drives, my fears, all this uh, is, is mental. Quite right. Uh, and so in sitting, um, as soon as we attempt to sit and, and find this silence, um, we're bombarded uh, with thoughts. We're bombarded with discomfort. We're, and so what is happening when, that, when that, all that comes up? That comes up. So, so what you have to do to get silent is to not go with the bombardment, mm -hmm. not suppress it, not struggle it, not reason or analyze it, but just let it go by watching it and not reacting to it when there are reactions, watching your reactions too, mm -hmm. and letting those go too, in this way you disengage. Mm -hmm. so let me and ask, you get free of them. Yeah. Let me ask you, Karen, because <coughs> yeah. you were at the concert. So did you, did you have any sense about the, the different worlds that were present there? Or? Well, I definitely had the sense that they were sort of stirring up the emotions. It was definitely to, it was designed in the way they did it and how they got this, this song started low and then they built up the, the tempo of the song that they were sort of stirring up the emotions, mm -hmm. yeah. But I was also sort of observing it. I was aware that, oh, okay, this is something very different than what we experienced all day, uh, but I didn't find it it was pleasant, but. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you also put in the category of doing yoga, you know, and Karen and I are both. We big love yoga. Yoga yeah. followers. Yeah. We do a yeah. lot of yoga. And so, um, but I actually get a lot out of it because I feel that um, I'm exploring my edges in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, here's where uh, my, my barrier, here's where my resistance is. And so I find that it's not that different in a way from, from the meditation because I'm having to uh, face my struggles. You mean yoga? In, mm -hmm. When I'm doing the yoga. When you're doing yoga. Yeah, yeah but it's still a body activity. No? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh -huh. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this or kirtan. Right. But it's still the physical and mental plane. No? Right. And w silence is not physical or mental plane. Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. beyond. Mm -hmm. And physical and mental is in time and space, mm -hmm. whereas silence is, there's no time and space in silence. Mm -hmm. So it's beyond time and space. So uh, when we're sitting, um, and so we feel this deepening happen. And so when can we say, you know, this is silence? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So, so the mind gets quiet and you feel a little peaceful and the silent beginning. Now, there could still be not complete clarity. And so as you sit more and more, as you sit with, as you practice the sitting, you could discover deeper levels of silence, clearer levels, it gets clearer and clearer. And then you start feeling the qualities of silence. Mm -hmm. Then it's not just simple, just peace, yeah. which silence would give you but its qualities mm -hmm. of uh, infiniteness, of compassion, mm. of love, beauty, of intelligence, of knowing, mm -hmm. knowing everything, being connected with everything, and uh, being present, understanding everything, understanding that everything is included in this, all without concept or thought, just the silence itself has this understanding. Mm -hmm. Silence is a state of consciousness which has this understanding because there's, it's a non-dual state. Mm -hmm. There's no experience in this. There's only the silence. You've disappeared. So there's a trap because when we sit to meditate or do any practice, uh, we want there to be some sort of fruit from it. Yeah, that's uh -huh. right. So, so y y in this case, 
that as long as you want a fruit from it, you're in duality and you're still in the mental plane, mm -hmm. wanting some result. You're still in the mental plane. You have to give up that too. Mm -hmm. Not expect any result, not want a result. Of course, the aim is to get free. Mm -hmm. But to think it or want it keeps you in the mental plane and away from silence. Yeah, ahead, you were saying to me today, one of the most profound things you said today in the, uh, the seminar was you said that you have to want to, to know the self. Mm -hmm. You have to want that more than anything else yeah. above your relationships, above family, above uh, any, any kind of reward. Can you talk more about that? Because I think that's a really yeah. profound yeah. thought. So, so what I said is, and I, I've, I've said this at the end of many seminars, is that what's required in this practice is that you desire to discover the self as the highest priority in your life, more important than anything in the world, more important than your body and mind, which means your thoughts and memories and feelings and so on, more important than your relationships, your partner, your children, your family, more important than your business, your activity, your possessions, more important than power and name, fame, and more important than anything that's there in the world. If that priority is given to finding yourself, discovering yourself, then it's easy to let go. Mm -hmm. But if you have other priorities, mm -hmm. like family and work, and in Karen's case, the students she was worrying about and so on, if those are your priorities, it's difficult to let go. Mm -hmm. But can you explain how you're not abandoning your responsibility to your worldly obligations? Oh no, no you're not abandoning, you mm -hmm. see. When I say let go, it doesn't mean leave. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. I say let go of identification with your house, your property, your car, mm -hmm. your family, it doesn't mean leave them. Mm -hmm. Leaving is easy. Mm -hmm. Just walk out of the door and that doesn't make you free. Mm -hmm. People think it makes you free and they do walk out. Mm -hmm. But you carry your problem with you. That's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about. We're saying you have to let go of identification with everything mm -hmm. in the world. Just, we said simply to let go of everything, but really it means let go of identification with everything. Mm -hmm. So everything's still there, but you're not identified with them. And if you're not identified with them, they no longer have the power to pull you out mm -hmm. into an entangling with the entanglement with them. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it's easy to discover yourself. Mm -hmm where there's nothing pulling you out. So my experience maybe approaches that language differently because to think like I can just let go, you know, I'm gonna let go of this entanglement, <laughs> let go of that. Yeah. And it's usually that um, there's a, usually some kind of crisis. It could be a mini crisis, a major crisis, where you're confronted with what has to be let go. Mm. Um, and so you're gonna either sort of cling more tightly or it, um, you surrender, you know, there's a sacrifice involved, you know, and, and you don't see someone sacrificing. It's not like, you know, Abraham on top of the mountain. The, the sacrifice is internal. Um, and so the letting go, uh, from my experience, is, uh, it's almost like you have no choice. <laughs> yeah, but now you're talking of in a crisis situation where you realize you have no choice. But actually, every moment of your life, you have no choice. Mm. Mm. And this one has to realize. You, know? mm. you see, you realize in a crisis situation that you have no choice. Mm -hmm. You know, you're cornered and there's nothing you can do about it. So you realize that, and if that's an important experience that you realize it. But you must also realize that every moment of your life, there's nothing you can do. There's the idea or the thought that you can do, but actually that's not true. That's only an illusion. So because we're identified with our striving and everything that has to be done in a day and my big long list, uh, there's the feeling that we're making accomplishments, that we have this agenda. Um, 
But what you're saying is if we were in silence, all of this could unfold uh, in a more sort of natural flow. That's right. Mm -hmm. In a natural flow, in a more harmonious way, in a way of clarity without crises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if there is a crisis, even the crisis is not a crisis, that's easily gone through as well. Mm -hmm. Because you already surrendered. You're, you're already in a state of surrender. You see, in this awareness, you're in a state of surrender. You don't need a crisis to make you surrender. Mm -hmm. You're already in a state of surrender where you're allowing things to happen. You, you understand that there is no choice. Mm -hmm. You understand for every little detail, there's no choice, should I drink this water or not? Even that's not a choice. Mm -hmm. See, it's, it's all happening. Mm -hmm. Now, well, what's the proof of this? You might say, of course I have a choice. I can drink this water or not. Mm -hmm. It's my choice. And I say, no, it's not your choice. It's already written. Mm -hmm. Whether you're going to drink it on which day, at what time, you're going to drink this water. That's written too. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Now, no. I'll tell you the proof of this. Uh -huh. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you the proof of this. Mm -hmm. I, I told you last time I'd prove it. Mm -hmm. you know? The proof is this. See, I think I can do. Mm -hmm. I think I have a will, mm -hmm. OK, to sit up or walk or whatever. The truth is, there is no I. So how can, how can there be a choice? There's the illusion of I mm -hmm. and the illusion of I can do, I can accomplish, I can succeed. That's an illusion. You see, the tr when you inquire into the I mm -hmm. with the question, who am I, which, is, which leads to silence and leads to this clarity of, of silence, there's no I there. Mm -hmm. so and we, you're functioning in the best possible way, right. in the most harmonious way. Mm -hmm. And that's the proof mm -hmm. that it's, it's all happening. So you're describing, let's just call it an <coughs> idealized state. Mm -hmm. But to get there requires a tremendous degree of trust. Of course. Well, so of course. talk more about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so trust. It requires tremendous amount of trust, complete trust. And the mind cannot trust. The mind will not trust. Because? Because the mind has contradictions. Mm -hmm. The mind is dual. Mm -hmm. So if it trusts, it mistrusts. Mm -hmm. If it loves, it hates. So the mind cannot trust mm -hmm. completely. It will also mistrust at the same time. Mm -hmm. It will trust you. And then at another moment, it will not trust you, mm -hmm. you know, and so on. So the mind cannot trust, and we are in the mind, stuck in the mind, entanglement, mm -hmm. entangled in the mind, and that's the problem of our life. Mm -hmm. We can't live in trust. Mm -hmm. We can't. How can you trust? Mm -hmm. You can't trust anything. You can't trust the politicians, the leaders, your family, your children. You can't trust the weather. You can't trust anything because everything is subject to change. So now. You say it requires a tremendous amount of trust, and I said 100% trust mm -hmm. is required. So how do we go about it? The mind cannot trust, so get the mind out of the way. Yeah. And that's the practice of silence. That leads to silence. And in silence, there's complete trust. Silence is trust. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the qualities of silence as love, compassion, and so on. And one of the qualities is trust, mm -hmm. a complete trust, because everything's happening from there. So everyone, you know, has problems, and the problems are always in the categories of financial, relationship, health, uh, maybe there's one other, those are three biggies. And so we feel that we have to solve these problems, you know. These are really important issues facing me right now, and I have to find my way through them. And so then you say, no, just trust. Uh, but we're not being asked to be passive. No, not at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. So, so you have to, these problems have to be solved, mm -hmm. but you don't have to solve them. They have to be solved through you. Mm -hmm. So you can't be passive. They have to be solved through you. So say, slow down and have to be solved through you. What does That's that right. mean? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're in silence mm -hmm. or in a state of awareness, which mm -hmm. is the same thing, mm -hmm. then things happen through you. The problems are dealt with through you. You have to deal with the problems. Mm -hmm. You can't be passive. Now, I'll give you a little story for that uh, mm -hmm. to illustrate clearly if 
people misunderstand it and think you have to be passive and trust. Mm -hmm. That's not so. That will lead to calamity. The, the story is this. I'm, I'm cutting it short. It's a lengthy story, but I'm cutting it short. A person says he trusts God. Mm -hmm. So I'll prove it. I trust God. He lies on the road. You know, an elephant comes mm -hmm. on the road. Someone on the, on the pavement is saying, get out of the way, an elephant's coming. He said, no, no, I trust God. Mm -hmm. I trust God. God will protect me. You know? I trust God mm -hmm. completely. And he lies there, elephant tramps on him, he dies. He dies, he goes to heaven, and he meets God. And he says, God, I trusted you and see what you did. Mm -hmm. And God said, I sent someone to tell you, get out of the way, mm -hmm. and you didn't listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see? So, so you can't be passive and you can't say, I trust God. Mm -hmm. You have to be in trust, not of God for something. Right. It's a state of trust. Not trusting somebody with something, not that. That's duality again. Just being in trust. And when you're in this trust, then things happen. Mm -hmm. There's no contradiction, there's no conflict. Things happen in a flow. So, so Karen, earlier today you were <coughs> asking this question about you know, your mind is racing through the thousand and one right. things. thousand and one things that I f need to do and, and how to plan always, and do at, them. When you're in bed, you decide to Yeah, and, and when, at night I, I tend to do that. Though it's interesting, as you're talking just now, it reminds, takes me back to when I had my cancer diagnosis that, that I was in a state of trust, but I wasn't being passive at the same time. So when I needed to do one thing or another, uh, so I did So talk it. about how you followed the breadcrumbs <coughs> in that journey. I don't know. There was a sense of knowing w when an action needed to be taken, uh, or which do doctor I wanted to go, I needed to go see. Uh, um, I mean, you were with me the whole time, mm -hmm. so how would you talk well, about it? I think it? Uh, an interesting point since we're bringing this story up, is um, on New Year's Eve, uh, you collapsed in my arms with right. a brain tumor. Right. Um, and we didn't know that you had seven months to live, but we found that out a few years, a few later. years later. And yeah. on the same afternoon, my business of 16 years collapsed. And so two days after that, I'm in the lobby of the hospital, uh, and you were wheeled downstairs you know, to have your brain opened up, which is a terrifying thought. And Bhagwan, you were up in your um, uh, in your mountain uh, retreat there in Where, India. In India. In, in India. India. And so I, you know, <coughs> uh, texted you, and I think you just had a little flip phone or something <laughs> up there, and you just wrote the words back: um, "Tell Karen everything will be okay." <laughs> <laughs> We I held on to that. I, I, I we don't held on that, to that, but I can believe it. <laughs> I can believe I said right. that, uh, but I don't remember it. Yeah. And we held on to that. Tell Karen everything will be okay. But yeah. you followed the. You weren't <laughs> passive. Say a little bit. I more. wasn't passive. I wasn't passive, but I wasn't. Um, I wasn't into that mind thing that I get into, where I'm perseverating about worrying about this, or should I do it this way, or do I need to say it this way, or. You know, I wasn't doing that. I was just sort of feeling my way, and an opportunity arose. A doctor, someone told me about a doctor, and I thought, okay, I'm going to follow that thread. And so it was sort of like that. Is there more that I could say? No, but it sounds like, in a sense, you're being guided. <clears throat> I was being guided, for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when you're saying this, Bhagwan. I know that experience that you're talking about, but it's, it's interesting that I don't always follow that that I get into my mental worrying about things. Yeah, so the moment you get into your mental worrying, you're not following the inner guidance. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say that's really true. So when you get the mind out of the way, that means there's no worry, there's no stress, no tension, and you're silent. Mm -hmm. It's clear what needs to be done next. But this place you're describing, you know, being able to act from silence, it's more than intuition, is it? It's more than intuition, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like going to the source, the source of the universe, the source from where everything happens, mm -hmm. the energy from, that moves the planets and so on. You're going to that place. Now, that's the, that's the energy that pumps your heart and makes you move and makes you awake and so on. So you're going to that place. Now, that place is all-knowing, all-intelligent, all-powerful. 
and you're going to that place, of course, that's, that place would guide you. The, that, mm. that energy or that conscience would guide you mm -hmm. in the right way. There's no doubt about it. So an interesting, maybe it's a side mm. note, uh, is during the meditation, you know, the first session, I was very um, clear, grounded, quiet inside. And then uh, in the second session, uh, all of a sudden I had this idea that I wanted to post something about my book on Facebook. <laughs> and the moment I got involved in that, there was just a flood <coughs> of things. And I started thinking about our Rumi festival and this, that, and the other. And, and so in a later session, when you were talking about um, the creative force, uh, which you know manifests the world, that it's not a bad thing per se. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of the universe that that when we are flooded with thoughts and ideas and so forth, and uh, and we become compelled by them, that it's actually the universe doing its dance. Can you say more about that? Yeah. <clears throat> so. You say the first session was good and grounded and made you clear. Mm -hmm. the, in second session, all these creative thoughts came. Right. right. Now, <clears throat> that happens. That's a phenomenon that happens. Now, the trick is, or the best thing to do is to watch these creative ideas, not go with them. Mm -hmm. To watch them out of the state of creativeness, don't lose the creative place. The tendency is that you'd go out with these creative thoughts and try to pursue them. Mm -hmm. Rather, what's recommended is to stay in this creative silence mm -hmm. and watch, this, watch the stuff coming out. So you remain in clarity and you watch all the stuff coming out. So the best is chosen and the best, uh, many ideas may come. So the best is easily selected and you, you go according to that. So not to go with what's coming up, Mm -hmm. but to remain in this creative space and watch all what's coming up and it'll be clear what needs to be done. So to remain in this creative place, it's sort of a, a heightened wakefulness. Yep. That, that you, it's, it's okay uh, to be present for everything that's happening. It's sort of a dynamic place. It's not like trying to um, you know, get your mind very peaceful, but it's a very energy. No, it's, it's not just... Well, it's peaceful in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then, as I said, as you go deeper and deeper and clearer and clearer, all this creative stuff comes up. Mm -hmm. Something may come up or something may not come up. Even if nothing comes up, the silence is a creative energy. Mm -hmm. You feel creative. Even your breathing mm -hmm. is creative. Well, you, you won't even be conscious of your breathing. But whatever happens from that space is creative. Mm -hmm. So just to change gears a little bit, um, I. Uh, we have a friend um, whose brother is actively dying, and he's in hospice. And part of the report that she gave to us is just that he's incredibly agitated and confused and wants to go home and, and all this kind of thing. And it uh, really brought to light for me that this work we're doing is very practical in the sense of why are we here in terms of, you know, that we are not paying um, attention to the fact that this life is a journey, and that um, and the work that we're doing now, you know, you could say pays off, um, you know, on the day we die. And, and maybe you could sort of bring this together in that way. Yeah, I'll tell you. So, <clears throat> the purpose of the purpose uh, of this practice is to discover yourself. And or the purpose of your life is to discover yourself, that's told to you in the beginning. Now, each meditation is like a dying. Mm -hmm. Because each meditation is a letting go of everything. See? Mm -hmm. And then when you come to the I thought, that's the only thought left, even that goes. That's like a death, mm -hmm. a death of the I. So it's an experience of death while alive mm -hmm. and getting beyond death while alive. You see? So when you practice this, there's no more fear of death. You've experienced it many times. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be agitated like, like your friend is, mm -hmm. because your friend must be 
you know, terrified by the thought of dying or mm -hmm. what's going to happen or what it is and all that. Mm -hmm. So a person who's meditating and experiencing death, facing death, because all your stuff comes up, all your demons come up and you're facing them and letting them go and getting beyond them and then getting finally beyond the I thought, which is an experience of death, there's no more fear then. Mm -hmm. You've overcome it, you've experienced it many times, while alive. Mm -hmm. So each meditation is an experience of death. You see, silence is death of everything. Mm -hmm. Everything has died, everything has disappeared, mm -hmm. everything is extinct, and you're silent, mm -hmm. and peaceful, and fulfilled. So where's the fear? of death. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is a, it's a lifelong practice. Sure. It's not like you just you know, throw the switch during no, no. one meditation. No, no, it's a lifelong practice. But as I said, mm -hmm. it, it, it depends upon what priority you give it, what longing you have. Because if you have strong longing and give it priority, then it goes much faster. No? Mm -hmm. But if you don't have uh, if you don't give priority, if other things have priority, your family, your body, mind, your business and all, if those have more priority than finding yourself, then you won't be inclined to go in that direction. You, your meditation won't work. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a case of, for example, someone who said, uh, uh, another participant who said, I nearly came for the Atlanta seminar. <laughs> what do you mean you nearly came? <laughs> if you had longing and intent, you would have come. If it was your priority, you'd be here. Mm -hmm. But it's, if it's half your priority, you don't show up. Mm -hmm. You see? So, so your, the priority has to be, this has to be the main priority of your life, the only priority. Mm -hmm. And I say only because you don't have to worry about your family won't be looked after, or your business won't be looked after, because when this is your priority, everything is looked after. Mm -hmm. But everything's included in this priority. Mm -hmm. The priority of finding yourself and the discovery of the self includes everything in the universe. Mm -hmm. You see, so you don't have to worry about your business or your family, or everything is looked after. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Karen, did you want to say anything uh, else? I was just struck when you said earlier, Bhagwan, about the feeling the different qualities, the different of silence. And I noticed in this meditation, uh, particularly today, that there were times that the silence was very deep. And I, I wouldn't have used those words, but I, as you spoke about it just a minute ago, I got a little taste of oh, what that might be like to have the different qualities of silence, mm -hmm. which it actually sounds kind of thrilling. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And so I keep saying the understanding comes not through the words, right, right, but right. by silence itself mm -hmm. reveals its qualities and gives you an understanding of the universe. Mm -hmm. That, for example, that the universe is not really, we are not separate forms. Everything is one, every atom in the universe, and there, there's no two, there's only one. So that understanding, the mind can never have. Mm -hmm. So that you have in silence, and then the understanding of infinite love, for example, or unconditional love, the mind can't have that. The mind always mm -hmm. has a reason and an object to love and so on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So unconditional love and infinite beauty and understanding of the universe, mm -hmm. that everything is one. There, there's no separateness at all. It's created by the mind. Mm -hmm. So the mind can't understand it because the mind creates separateness. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those qualities uh, you get in silence. And so I say the meditation is not just to find peace, it's to know, know about everything. It's an enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It's to understand everything. How the universe is created, what the universe means, what's the purpose of the universe. Not in words, but just in a knowing. In a silent knowing, you know all this. Well, I would just like to finish by saying that uh, you have been coming to our home for 25 years. Um, and so this quality of journey 
together, you know, is so powerful for me because we were looking at some old photos <laughs> and realizing we were at Lake Hartwell. Oh, and, right, and right. And how young we were and didn't have a clue um, yeah. about this, you know. Just you could even see in the pictures, we were really in the mind in those <laughs> you pictures. You can see it in the photos. <laughs> you really can. <laughs> we'll have to show them to you. Yeah. So there's no you know, apparatus that measures how much change has happened to me, but I will say um, it's quite profound. And so I just want to say thank you for coming all this way you know, from, from Europe and from India all these years. And I'll just put a last word. When Raven was going... I said, Raven, you've progressed? She's saying, yes, I think so. And I said, well, she said it's taken many years. But I said, no problem. But remember, there's no limit to your progress. Mm. There's no limit. Mm. You're talking of infinite. Mm. So even if it takes a long time, but look what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You're talking for an infiniteness. There's no limit to your capacity. Mm. Okay, well, we'll have to do another one of these <laughs> next year. We'll be just completely different. <laughs> Thank you, Bhagwan. Thanks, Bhagwan. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, too.